You're listening to the 40 Fit Radio Podcast, dedicated to the 40-plus community. Join us as we discuss the truth about fitness and health using science, reason, and the experiences of our host and content experts. Welcome to the 40 Fit Nation. Welcome back to 40 Fit Radio. This is Coach Trent. Today we are going to listen in on the second part of Coach D's conversation with Robert Santana, who is a starting strength coach and a res- registered dietitian. He's also the head nutrition coach for Starting Strength Online Coaching, and he's got a lot of great experience training regular folks who are uh, trying to lose weight, trying to lose body fat, trying to gain muscle, and just generally look better naked. So. We're going to drop in now to the second part of the conversation. So if you're overeating calories and you're on a high fat diet, you're just going to store more fat and the amount of fat you burn doesn't really change. Yeah. Right. But if you overeat carbs, you burn more carbs and then you get worse at burning fat. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. I used to always think that the fat cell held sugar or glycogen in it and fats, uh, triglycerides, but what you're telling me is, is that most of the gly- the glycogen is held in the kidney, the liver, and the bloodstream, right? And it, some in the muscle, too. No, it's in the liver and muscle primarily, the bloodstream via glucose, okay. yeah. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. So what's in the fat cell, then? Triglyceride. Okay, yeah. so what you're saying is, if you overeat carbs, mm-hmm. like we talked about earlier, you're going you're gonna to burn those carbs off. Mm-hmm. But whatever fat that you're ingesting, because you have a caloric surplus, you have more calories than you should be eating, Mm -hmm. whatever fat you're eating at all is going to get converted towards storage in the, in the fat cell as as a triglyceride. That's correct. Okay. And, uh, on the same token, if you overeat enough carbs, they can also get converted into fat, but they have to go through several extra metabolic steps that we don't need to go into that level of detail, but okay. let's, but it's let, possible. Yeah. So when you eat fat, it's already in its stored form. It's already triglyceride. So okay. it just gets stored. Okay. But when you're eating glucose, that is not triglyceride. So it has to go through several steps to become a triglyceride. So normally when someone is overeating, let's say, let's say they eat, they eat a processed food diet, you know, lots of carbohydrates. Mm-hmm. It would, would the food stuffs that they're normally eating also have a fairly fairly high fat level and that's what's actually causing them to have weight gain so this gets back to metabolic efficiency right okay so the human body's lazy it likes efficiency so the easiest way to get fat is to eat a high carb high fat diet because what we just talked about if you overeat carbs you get better at burning carbs you get less efficient at burning fat more efficient at storing fat Makes sense. Okay. So what's high carb, high fat? Donuts, Snickers bars, Got movie it. theater popcorn. Processed foods. Yeah. Hamburgers. Potato chips. Yeah. 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 They're high in carbohydrates and high in fat. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Adding Makes sense. butter to everything you eat, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's not the it. butter itself. It's the fact that, let's say you're eating a hamburger and you add butter to the bun, butter it right. all up, you know, and depending on how you're cooking. Right. You now eat, you yeah. have high carbohydrate with the bun and now you have high fat with the butter. Yep, with the butter, so, with the fat and the beef. Now you're yeah. adding a bunch, you know, you're basically eating a high-carb, high-fat meal sure, right there. Sure, sure. But okay, makes sense. most people, especially with the stuff that you're reading in a lot of magazines, just look at the bun. They're like, oh, it must be the carbs from the hamburger yeah, bun. Yeah. It's, it's not that the carbs are bad or the fat's bad. It's the combination. Right. You know? Makes if sense. If you're eating a lot of carbs and a lot of fat, that's the easiest way to yeah. gain body fat. The body likes efficiency. Yeah, it makes Just sense. Burn the carbs off, get rid of them, and store the fat. Yeah, sure. Um, so that's what I meant earlier. You can theoretically convert carbohydrate and protein into body fat via several metabolic steps, but the human body is lazy, and it's going to require a humongous surplus that most people aren't going to achieve yeah. for that to physiologically happen. Yeah, sure. But sure. this is kind of like what we were talking about earlier with – Middle of the foot versus not middle of the foot at our coaches seminar, yeah, our yeah. separate topic. It's yeah. like this is something that the audience we're talking to, they don't really need to understand that level of detail. What you yeah. need to know yeah. is that you can't have a lot of both. 
Yeah. Plain sure. and simple. Sure. You know, if you're going to eat a lot of fat, you probably can't have a lot of carbs and vice versa. Yeah. Does that make sense? If someone wants, you know, we were talking about the individual that yeah. comes to you that's trainee and, and they're also doing nutritional counseling mm-hmm. and they want to basically just maintain weight. What is a good balance between carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, mm-hmm. macronutrients, percentage of total caloric intake? Um, actually, I said it earlier, 50, 25, 25 works okay. good for the strength training. 50% yeah. carbohydrates. Yep. 25% fat, 25% protein. Yeah, that okay. works out pretty well if you want okay. absolute numbers. What I've found to work well for most, um, we'll do by gender, most males, about 300 carbs, sub 100 fat, so less than 100 grams of fat, and uh, somewhere between 150, 200 grams of protein, depending okay. on size. Okay. And then for a female, it's somewhere around 200 carbohydrates, about 100 to 150 grams of protein, depending on size. And uh, 70 grams of fat or less. And so that's, we're, we're talking about general maintenance here. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah. Not weight gain, not weight loss. Yeah, yeah. Those are yeah. pretty, I mean, that's not going to give you six pack abs. Right. You know, right. but it's not going to make you morbidly obese either. Right. I mean, right. but, um, and those, those are just general numbers that I've seen through years of practice. Those are not, you know, out of any position paper or sure. guideline or, so, you know. So I'll tell you, like, like my wife is, is, yeah. is 50 plus. Mm-hmm. Um, and carbohydrate intake seems she thinks carbohydrate intake mm-hmm. significantly influences her her body mass right um could it be that it's not just her carbohydrate intake but it's also the combination between the carbs and fats of course that are really influencing her her body mass well the best type of carbohydrates are high in fat yeah yeah exactly you know, the chocolate yeah. the ones that taste yeah. the best yeah 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 i mean um Chocolate is my favorite example. Um, a lot of my clients, I don't want to, you know, narrow this down to gender, but sure, a lot of female sure. clients like chocolate, especially <laughs> during certain times of the month. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, chocolate's high carb, high fat. You yeah. know, it's, you know, yeah. it's taste. You notice the sweetness. And it's smooth. Yeah, yeah. It's real silky smooth. Yeah, why do you think that is? High in fat. Right, yeah, so right. smooth and silky smooth and right. sweet. That's the right. best combination. Yeah. Or for the males, a lot of males like pizza. Yeah. Yeah, What's in sure. pizza? Cheese. That's yeah. very high in fat. Oil yeah. or butter, depending yeah. on how they're making the crust. Right, right. And uh, then high you got carbohydrate. Yeah, then the bread, high carb, high fat. Yeah, you know, sure. A hamburger, cheeseburger, high sure. carb, high fat. French yeah. fries. You know, these all these foods that we all like to eat, the most savory ones. Yeah, are high in both. And the thing about fat is not not that fat's like this evil demon macronutrient. It's that right. it has double the amount of calories. So. If it has nine calories per gram, just think about what that looks like as a portion, right? Sure, sure. So, like, you ever weighed out a portion of peanut butter, like a serving size? It's, no. It's no. like... Mm, Tiny or... It's or? T- it's like, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. I used to have these little portions, like a marble. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, like two Wow, mar- that's one portion size. Because so, it's so yeah. high in fat. So, the serving size in peanut butter is two tablespoons. And two tablespoons are like two large marbles. Yeah. Which aren't very big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's a, yeah. No, it's yeah. real high in fat. I know yeah. that. And so, so that's a that's a hundred and ninety. Let's round it up to two hundred calories, right? Right. Just for two marbles. Yeah. So yeah. if you're a basal metabolic rate, or let's yeah. say your calorie that yeah. you're eating for the day are two thousand calories, mm-hmm. then you just ate ten percent of your caloric intake for the total yeah. day with two marble sized portions. Yeah. Actually, because now we're doing this new uh, system for SSOC, the um, even more familiar portion size would be a thumb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I generally yeah. say yeah. for protein, yeah. the yeah. size of my palm. Yep, yep. Per setting, yeah. for carbohydrates, the size of a fist. Yep, yep. And for fats, the size of my thumb. Yep, yep. Is that right? Is that yep. about right? Yep, yep. Okay. So good. peanut butter's two thumbs up. Yeah, yeah. I got it. That yeah. sounds good. Yeah, yeah. That sounds good. And that's not a lot of food. Yeah, but. Think about people who get addicted to peanut butter. They eat a whole jar. That's sure. 12, that's 1,200 calories in a jar of peanut butter. Yeah. Holy cow. Who could eat a whole jar of peanut butter? Yeah. Holy frick. That's, that's a lot of yeah. peanut butter. Yeah. But I do like Nutella, I have to admit. Oh, yeah. Sounds and it's good. it's dangerous. That's it's even, very dangerous. That's even higher carb. And I know. The I, like, the same. I like Nutella and peanut butter mixed together. Oh, man. It's man, very man. dangerous. <laughs> and Weller. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, or, you know, whiskey goes good with anything, but, yeah. but, okay. So we've, we've covered a little bit about metabolic rate. Well, first calories, mm-hmm. 
we've covered um, metabolic rate, the fact that humans have this rate of burning calories, and it varies from individual to individual, and genetics plays a, a significant role on yeah. that. And that really is the bulk of our caloric burn per day, mm -hmm. not our activity level or anything else. It's mm -hmm. really based on genetics. Mm -hmm. And then we've talked a little bit about the macronutrients. where We talked about proteins, carbohydrates, and fats and their role. We talked mostly about proteins and carbohydrates. Now, fat is a fuel source. Mm -hmm. What else does fat serve to do? So it's the number one thing is obviously it's an energy depot because we need... We have what's called essential fat. So there's fat around our organs. And uh, most people think of that as, you know, visceral fat. People that have read into this sort of thing. Visceral fat means that it's around your central organs like your heart, your intestines, et cetera. And if you have too much of that, that could be associated with diabetes or heart disease. Sure. But let's put that topic aside for this podcast. Generally, if you ever... If anybody's taken an anatomy and physiology class and had to um, dissect an animal, sure. you'll see fat all over the organs and pretty much mm -hmm. everywhere. Visceral fat. Yeah, that, that's that's normal because you need that for cushion, for shock right. absorption. Let's say if I punch you in the chest and you don't have any fat behind there, right. you know I'm going to be able to protection possibly, yeah, of your yeah, organs. Yeah, you protects bet. your organs. Um, provides warmth. Yep, right. Makes sense. That's why the Eskimos tend to have more body fat than somebody that's in uh, Florida. Right. You know. Right. Makes that, sense. That's natu you know naturally born and raised in florida or whatever sure, for centuries sure. whatever um so yeah so that's why you know it provides warmth um it also forms our cell membranes okay right so yeah. we need it for that yeah. um hair skin and nails mucous and, membranes yeah. all those areas all yeah. membranes yeah. are inside yeah. our nose inside yeah. our ears exactly right all those areas that that need to stay moist or have a certain level of lubrication because lubrication is everything Remember exactly. that. This is true. So I'm just just throwing that out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there, you know, there's good fats and bad fats, right. right? So then, what I always tell people, this is just a general analogy I like to give. It may not be 100 percent true, but it tends sure. to get the job. It's like a cue, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, if it's solid at room temperature, it's probably solid in your arteries, right? Oh, very good. So saturated yeah. fat tends to be a animal fat. So it's so there's fats and oils, right? Like Crisco is solid at room temperature. Yeah. Yep. So not as good for you. But olive oil is a liquid at room temperature. Yep. Better for you. Right. Right? Yep, yep. It makes sense. That yep. makes a lot of sense. Yep. Okay. Just like fish oils or fish. Yeah. Yeah. Fish is yeah. going to be high in omega-3s, and that is associated with a lower risk of heart disease. Got right? it. Right? Got it. So you definitely need those, you know. That's why they recommend eating fish several times a week. Sure, So that you sure. can get more omega-3s. Um, peanuts and avocados tend to have healthy fats in them too. And uh, all that helps with lipid transport too, yeah. right? Yeah. So it can increase your good cholesterol, lower your bad cholesterol, right? So right. your good is your HDL, your high-density lipoprotein, and your bad is your quote-unquote LDL, your low-density right. or your quote unquote bad is your right. LDL, your low density lipoprotein. So you can optimize those. So if you have higher HDL, lower LDL, then that's associated with a lower risk of heart disease. Right. Makes sense. I don't, I'm not going to go into the whole biochemistry yeah, no, that's of that. Great. You know, that's a yeah. whole separate podcast there. But yeah. yeah. So fats. So we've talked about proteins, carbs, mm -hmm. and fats. We've talked about the role of fats. Um, you know, organ protection, um, mucous membranes. It's another form of energy. I've always thought of fats as being a slower burn mm -hmm. type energy um, in the sense that it takes a little bit more work to get it out yeah. and to create it as an energy source, but it lasts longer. Right. So for like longer endurance activities mm -hmm. or activities that involve stamina that are beyond, let's say, two to three minutes, or more fats are generally a better fuel source for those types of activities for, for longer. Yeah. Right. But for big explosive activities like a one rep max, yeah. a set of five squats or a really short interval training, like a sprint, mm -hmm. you know, or some 400 meter sprint. Right. That's mostly going to be phosphocreatine mm -hmm. or glycogen. Yep. It's going to be basically sugar. That's precisely right. Yeah. Sugar. You're going to use that. Yeah. So, so let's talk about now, let's talk about, 
the individual that comes to you and they're my typical client base, which would be 40 plus, they have more around the middle than they want Mm -hmm. and they want to increase their, I I mean, I would say they want to increase their muscle mass. Sometimes I have to convince them that they need to get stronger. Right. um, Because I realize the value in that and what it can do for them. But what they want to do is basically just look good naked. Yeah, exactly. So how would you approach that client? So... That client needs to train, obviously. You're already taking care of that. Yeah. So we're assuming they're... Strength training, yeah. mostly. Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah. yeah they, or, cardio, or, or cardio conditioning work. If they want to look good naked, they need to lift weights. Okay. If they want to um, improve their cardiovascular health, they need to do some aerobic activity. So that's another thing to just kind of bring up as an aside. There's this you know misconception that doing conditioning work is going to kill your gains quote unquote yeah you know, that it's yeah. going to you're going to lose muscle you're not going to get stronger that's not entirely true if you endurance train that is 100 percent true yes absolutely so, so remember training versus exercise you talked about this in your other yeah. podcast yeah. yeah yeah so endurance training means that you're training for an endurance sport right, so like right. if you're training for a marathon your squat's not going up right right, right. And uh, there have been studies on this, and we've observed this. We know how this works. You know, yeah. if you start running a bunch of miles every day, you're going to prioritize that activity in terms of yeah. meditation. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to concurrently train with conditioning and strength training, the conditioning should be high intensity interval training, short sprints. It should be of a very short nature, more intense, and then the, you can throw that in with some strength training, right? And you get the best of both worlds. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really it's volume and intensity based. Yeah. So even yeah. if like if you have somebody that doesn't they have bad knees and they can't sprint for whatever right. reason, right. they can still do thirty minutes at like, you know, fifty or sixty percent of their max heart rate. Yeah. And yeah. that's not gonna interfere with their squats. Yeah, they could do rowing you know? intervals. Or they that. Yeah. Rowing intervals or, or that, like yeah. the assault bike, arm yeah. bike, or whatever. Yeah. 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 I have people that do it both ways, you know. Yeah. Sure. But I'm not pushing somebody to the point of where I'd consider that endurance training, you know? Right, right. So aerobic exercise is right. fine for the strength training and it's probably good especially if for the age group we're talking about sure sure but um aerobic training now that's going to start interfering with your strength gains right right, right. so it's, it's important to clear i think that's not hammered enough yeah. in terms of like the lifting literature etc you know like the, yeah just the art not the research but the articles you know the yeah and one yeah. of the things that i promote with our prop population is i really promote the fact that the foundation of your program should be strength training yes because we want to drive lean mass gains Mm -hmm. we want to drive more muscle fat mass on the frame of the average male or female the conditioning is an aside is a adjunctive Mm -hmm. to do one of two things number one improve some cardiovascular function and number two create more of a caloric burn if we're trying to get um, a, a weight loss right. in this scenario. Right. So, yeah, even with that, like riding your bike to work is a fit. You don't need much. I guess that's where I was yeah. about to go. You don't need yeah. much aer- yeah. aerobic for a Yeah, cardio- we're just throwing yeah. in a little bit more activity there. Yeah. To, to get a more caloric to get more caloric burn because with that with that individual that's trying to gain strength mm-hmm. and lose weight at the same time would you have them in a caloric deficit or or how would you approach that so this is a novice that's not obese well let's say they're obese okay and they're a novice Susie comes to me she's 45 years old mm-hmm. she's morbidly obese so she's let's say 50 pounds overweight mm-hmm. she's never lifted weights so she's probably leg pressing yeah yeah okay. she's not yeah. doing anything yeah yeah when she's not start, doing I mean, anything yeah yeah so how would you how would you approach her um nutrition so, so we'd create a deficit okay so the first thing is i'd get some well i've changed my approach i used to have my clients record what they were eating now i'm just having them take pictures of it because i find that um written accounts of what people eat aren't very accurate. We know that from oh, that's the re- interesting. We know that from the research literature. Yeah, and we know that from experience. Self-report. We're, humans are notoriously bad at this. Under-reporting or over-reporting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Und- over-reporting when it's supposed to be good. Yeah. Under-reporting when it's supposed to be bad. <laughs> Precisely right. Yeah. So with this new system we're rolling out um, in the new year, we're going to have them give us pictures. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah, I want to cool. see what it looks like yeah. what they're eating. Show me your breakfast, show me your lunch, yeah. and your dinner, and any snacks in between. Yeah. And just take a picture of it. Yeah, 
and that's te- cool. And that's cool. It's great that you know technology now allows to easily do that. Yeah, know? that's very cool. It's so a great it's like, idea. Yeah. So once I kind of see how they're eating, I adjust from there versus you know getting a bunch of calculations that are based on you know like the thing about calorie calculators is they're population specific. So these are derived from a group of people that they looked at, and then they. I'm assuming that they took their metabolic rate using a quote unquote gold standard. Right. Right. And then they came up with these equations. Yeah, right. Sure. But remember we have a population of what's the world population now? 7 billion. Yeah. Something yeah, like that. It's crazy. And a study with a hundred people, a thousand people that doesn't really apply to every single person. A very small yeah. cohort study. So it's, it's yeah. good for like population specific data. So if you're looking at large groups of people, sure yeah. you can use this, but sure. at the individual level, a lot of these um, calculators and metrics, even like BMI, you know, like things like yeah. that body mass index, um, they're not very good at the individual level. Right. So at the individual level, you got to be mo- a little bit more practical than this, right? Yeah. So I've never used calculators as a dietitian outside of a hospital because in the hospital, in the chart, they usually have the, you have to specify yeah. what. The BMI and all that stuff. Yeah, sure. the BMI, sure. you got to say how many kcals per kilogram yeah. did you estimate their calories to be. And that works pretty well too. I'm not saying that it doesn't. No method is accurate is what I'm kind of getting at. Yeah, sure. So I like to see what they're eating. And then I just adjust from there. Yeah. So I say, okay, this person's on a high carb, high fat, low protein diet, which is the stereotypical American diet. Okay. High fat, high carb, low protein. Which is not good. If they're no. trying to strength gain and lose yeah. weight, but gain lean mass, yeah. low protein, high carb, high mm-hmm. fat mm-hmm. is not good. Mm-mm. So how do you change it? So that's where we start working with the client on uh, reconfiguring that. Okay. Right? So historically, what I've done is I give them macronutrient recommendations or I'll give them a meal plan, you know, that is closer to the model that I described earlier, the 50, 25, 25. Okay. And uh, I don't always calculate it to be exactly that, but that's kind of like the layout I give them. So either they're going to fill the foods in themselves, plan the meals out themselves, and just going off the macros I give them, they're going to come up with their own meal plan. Or I give them a meal plan based on macros that I've come up with, and they just follow the schedule. So you've given them not only the ratio of calories per macronutrient, Mm -hmm. whether it be carbs, proteins, Mm -hmm. fats, and it's generally, let's say, 25% protein, um, uh, 25% fat, 50% carb, let's say. Um, But you're also giving them the total caloric value that they should be consuming in a day. Yep. And then you may or may not give them how to make up what, you know, where do the carbs come from? So do you follow the idea that let's say they said, okay, great. You said, you said I could have 200 grams of carbs. This candy bar is 150 grams of carbs, right? Can I eat this candy bar and then fill it in with the remaining carbs? So that's why I also give them fiber recommendations. Okay, great. And I think you may, you may or may not have seen that in some of the yeah, stuff I, I put up. Yeah. Yep, I have. So if, most females, I say 30 grams of fiber. Males, 40 grams of fiber. Which means they're going to have to be eating fruits and vegetables. That's right. Because that's where fiber comes from. Exactly. Fruits, okay. vegetables. Um, now, it depends. So fruits and vegetables, very broad term, right? Right, right. What I find is vegetables are not the best source of fiber because you have to eat a lot of vegetables. Yeah, to get, broccoli. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. have to eat like, it's like a crap load of Yeah, it's broccoli. a couple grams in a serving. And remember, yeah. vegetables have like five grams of carbohydrates per yeah. serving and yeah. the serving is pretty big. So a yeah, half cup of vegetables, yeah, half cup of vegetables is quite a bit of volume. Right. So you're not going to get 30 to 40 grams of fiber from sure. vegetables alone. Now fruit, if you're eating raspberries, blackberries, things like that. Strawberries, the high yeah. fiber fruits, right? Yeah. Apples, yeah. apples would be good too. Apples are okay, but not yeah. like raspberries. Raspberries are like 12 grams of fiber and a yeah. six ounce, yeah. you know, serving that comes in those little containers at the it's store. Great. I love them. Yeah. So, if you're not eating berries, you still have to eat quite a bit of fruit to right. get 30 to 40 grams of fiber. So those are good sources that I do recommend. I want people eating lots of fruits and vegetables because they do um, allow you to be fuller because they also have a lot of water. So the water content helps you feel fuller. And then they do contain fiber, so it contributes sure. to your total fiber. But then things like beans, legumes, um, so beans are legumes. So legumes such as beans, lentils, things like that are going to be much higher in fiber. So a serving of beans has seven grams of fiber, whereas maybe an apple only has like three. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, you bet. Then there's lots of fiber-fortified foods now. So you have like all-brand cereal or the all-brand buds. And one of the 
combinations that I've recommended in other podcasts are mix the all brand buds with Greek yogurt. You know, yeah, mix them sure. in there. That's like an easy breakfast that you can have if you don't have time in the morning. You know? High fiber, mm-hmm. but you got some good carbohydrates mm-hmm. and some good protein yep, there too. And not a lot of fat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. And just to hit that again, fat's not bad. It's just that you can accumulate a lot of calories quickly from fat. So yeah. I don't want this nine to come calories up. per yeah. gram. Yeah, I'm not very high. I'm not sitting here promoting a low fat diet. Twenty five percent of calories is not low fat. That's right. like considered moderate. So let's just hit that for a second. So low fat would be less than 20%, very low fat would be less than 10% of your calories. Yeah, sure. So on a 2,000 calorie diet, that's 20 grams or less or 10 grams or less. Okay. I mean, we're Makes rounding because it's nine, sure. you know. But um, the thing about fat is it's easy to get a lot because yeah. you don't need a lot of volume to yeah. get fat calories. Yeah, a handful yeah. of almonds is yeah. a lot of fat. Yeah. A handful of walnuts is a ton of fat. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a handful yeah. of broccoli is not anything no ca- fat. calorically yeah, exactly yeah. Yeah. no fat and no yeah, exactly. calories really so exactly a handful of almonds can give you 200 calories a handful yeah. of broccoli gives you 20 you right. know so that that's, right. that's what i mean so it's like i'm not saying watch your fat because i want you in a low fat diet and fat's this terrible thing i'm saying keep an eye on your fat because that's the one that's e- that's the easiest way to go over calories sure to get a surplus yeah and we don't want a surplus with this individual yeah. we want a, a, a deficit yeah okay and if you talk to people like old school power lifters or even guys now that try to gain weight. Right. Some of the things they say they do, like they say they put oil in their protein shakes. They start yeah. slamming extra fat because they can get their calories up to five, 6,000 sure. calories to get up to 300 pounds, you know? With a very small food volume. Exactly. And so they don't feel as full. They still feel full because fat satiates your hunger, yeah. right? But it doesn't fill them up in regards to volume. No. The, yeah. And I remember when I first started working as a dietitian in dialysis, the patients were overweight, obese, and they'd say, well, I don't even eat that much. And then when I was younger, I'd be like, oh, they're lying. Of course they eat that. Well, you can't be 300. Yeah. You know, now that I've coached a lot and I've learned more about um, what this actually looks like, because I always, yeah. you know, kind of knew the macros and what people should be eating, but yeah. I never actually like, after working with a lot of people, you kind of get a sense of where the problems are. Sure. And they weren't lying to me. They weren't eating a lot of food, but they were eating Cheetos and McDonald's, you know? So they were probably eating three small meals a day in terms of, like, the physical size of it. Right. But they were calorically dense, you right. know? Very high in fat. Yeah. And it's, very, one, thing, very it's fat. one thing to sit in an academic classroom and be talked to about caloric density. It's another thing right. to actually look at it and talk to somebody through it. Sure. And go through, hey, look, a hamburger at McDonald's has 15 grams of fat. That's almost 150 calories, you know? Right, right, and sure. And your calorie needs are 1,500. Let's say it's a small woman yep. you know, who doesn't work out. Right. That's 10% of your calories right there just from one little bitty hamburger. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I don't think I'm exaggerating that. I think yeah, it's and that's not that. including yeah. the fries and everything else. Yeah. They, they could potentially ingest, yeah. eat um, six, you know, 50, 60 grams of fat in a single setting mm-hmm. and not even know it. Exactly. And so they're, it's very calorically dense, increasing their total caloric intake Mm -hmm. and um, then they're behind the eight ball and they're not losing weight they're gaining weight and insidious weight gain you know let's think let's let's face it if you gained one pound a month which doesn't sound like much yeah it's 12 pounds in a year over 10 years you're 120 pounds overweight yeah and and so it it just gradually gains over time yeah that's exactly right and uh another way to think about that is if you take two meals yep one that is very high in fat and one that's very low in fat but very high in carbs. Both of those meals, let's say you put them on a scale, they weigh exactly the same. Right. The one that's high in fat, based on this is this rough analogy right here, based on what we talked about, is going to have twice the amount of calories yeah. for the same amount of food volume. Yeah, four, be- four versus nine. And it may be higher than that because remember, the carbohydrate-rich food is also rich in water. Yeah. So the water is contributing to the weight of that food. Sure. So you could take two meals that are five, or not, that's kind of an exaggeration. Let's say two meals that are a quarter pound of vegetables and a quarter pound of butter. Okay. The quarter pound of butter might have 10 times more. This is an exaggeration. Right, maybe, right, maybe, sure. Maybe it could yeah, be higher. Just, yeah, but right. let's say it has 10 to 15 times more calories than the right. quarter pound of but they're the same food yeah. volume yeah but they weigh the same right and right. then in terms of visual think about it, a quarter pound of butter is not going to look as large as a quarter pound of broccoli right you know? right yeah sure so that's how you want to look at this so that's why i say watch your fat because it can you can rack up the calories so really can, quick and, and if our goal with this individual yeah. that we're talking about is to get a a negative 
um, net surplus of caloric intake. Mm-hmm. We want to burn more calories than we eat. Mm-hmm. Then we've got to watch that fat. Mm-hmm. We've got to watch our carbs too. Yeah. And we want to be driving our protein fairly high. Right. And like you said, for a male, 150 to 200 grams based yeah. on their body mass. Yeah. Um, and for a female, somewhere around where on protein? I said one to 150. Yeah. 100, okay. 100 so 100 to 150. Yeah. Yeah. Very petite to a little bit larger female. Yeah. And so, and then the other calories, we just fill in behind it. Mm-hmm. At a ratio of about 50% carbs, good quality carbs, mm-hmm. and about 25% fat. That's exactly right. And then we just, how much of a deficit do you give that individual usually in total caloric value? So typically, based on what their baseline is, so let's say I look at other food and I determine that, hey, they're probably holding on 2,000 calories, okay. right? So All I'll right. go down to 1,500. I just, All right. I, I like to take a bigger so that's jump. a 25% reduction. Yeah. And I used to be a lot more conservative with it because the whole flexible dieting thing was popular yeah. in the last 10 years. It still is. And I do promote it. But I think some coaches take that way too far, like restricting 50 calories a week. I mean, yeah. there's a mental aspect to this. So if somebody thinks- It takes a lot longer, yeah. too, to lose the weight. Yeah, which, you know, we've historically said, hey, gradual is better, you know? Yeah. It's better to gradually lose it than to rapidly lose it. And yeah. there is truth to that. I'm not saying that's not true. What I'm saying is that the client mentally thinks that he or she is on a diet, yeah. right? So if you're, quote, unquote, giving re- macro recommendations and restricting calories every week for, I don't know, uh, 26 weeks, it's half a year. It takes forever. Even if they weren't at a deficit the first 12 weeks— in their head, they've been having to mess with their diet and be real strict, you know, for all this time. And that starts to create psychological problems, right? And I've seen this in practice. So I've uh, gotten away from, okay, I'm only going to restrict 50 calories a week. I, I don't do that. So it's more like three to four. I usually don't go 500. Actually, that was kind of a big number. Usually like three to 400 the first yeah, week, you know? Sure. Because I'd rather them lose it at a, you know, not a fast rate. Per right. se, you know, but I'd rather than lose it steadily for 12 weeks, you know, three months, three, four months. And then I use what's called a maintenance phase. You yeah, know? sure. Basically, I don't want some, like if somebody has to lose 100 pounds, they're not going to lose it in a single diet, right. a single cut or a single fat loss phase per, per se. It's going to be over three to four month period. They'll lose what they lose, you know, so let's say they lose 20 pounds, right? Okay. Well, that's, take the a, first, that's the first That's the transition that's first, first phase yeah first quote-unquote yeah. cutting phase for lack yeah. of a better word okay then i might hold them for one to three months you know yeah sure. if somebody's heavier i might hold them for one because their body's not yeah. getting really beat down by the diet you sure. know usually the first if you have a hundred psychologically they're not uh, yeah it's like okay take a break don't think about food so much just right. keep your weight the same you know eat out a few times here or there then we'll go back to it go back to work in a month sure, you know, or two months sense. yeah and then we'll do it again and then we'll just keep yeah. repeating this cycle to all the weights off and this way you know theoretically you would think that um they probably are less likely to regain the weight yeah because sure. now they're learning not only how to lose weight but they're learning how to maintain it with those little maintenance yeah. phases in between what's a good weight loss per week average pounds i typically say one percent of body weight okay is a good target but that meant you might necessarily hit that so like, so if someone weighs 300 that's yeah. three pounds if they weigh 200 yeah that's two pounds yeah that's fair. i like i like that because it's mm-hmm. it's different than the typical one to three pounds per week we yeah. talk about yeah it's one percent of body mass yeah. okay and let's talk about the behavioral aspect too right so um fat loss is very similar to an lp so Okay, if you have the 18-year-old kid who lives in his mom's basement, doesn't pay any bills, eats well, has good connective tissues, and gains 60 pounds, he might He's going to get strong very fast. And he's the antithesis of a motor moron and can do the lift perfectly every workout. Yeah, he's going to get strong fast. Yeah, he's going to add weight every single time for 12 weeks and do an awesome— It's it's a perfect linear progression of strength gain. But that doesn't usually happen. Right. And so weight loss could be better with some individuals— on a linear progression of weight loss. Yeah. They're going to lose weight faster than some other individuals. Potentially. Sure. You take, so, yeah, you take a competitive physique, uh, competitor, right. right who's right. in his off season. Right. And he's, you know, 20 pounds, 15 pounds over. Right. 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 He can lose that in 12 weeks because he's a competitor. Sure. He's going to do what yeah. he has to do. Yeah, he's exactly. going to stop eating out, not have a life, go yeah. crazy. Yeah. And then sure. go back to come back to life after the show. Yeah, but um, I like to bring that up because these guys are going to do whatever it takes for twelve weeks because they got to get on stage and look a certain way, right? Yeah, Bodybuilder, yeah. physique, competitor, right? right? Sure. 
So yeah, the twelve week cut per se that you see in all the magazines applies to this population. So I, I like that we're talking about this because I have not talked about this on another podcast. Yeah, I think a lot of the diet information in terms of weight loss expectations are based off of the standard twelve week program that bodybuilders do. Right, right. But bodybuilders are on a bunch of drugs too. Right, and that, sure. That influences it because if you're on a bunch of drugs, it's hard to lose muscle. Yeah, you yeah, know. I'm down. So. This is, number one, their job. Their job is to look a certain way on stage. That's sure. number one. Yeah. And number two, they're on a bunch of drugs. Right. Right? They're on anabolic steroids. So that changes the game because they can practically starve and not lose muscle mass. Right. I right. mean, I don't, I don't take that stuff. I don't recommend that stuff. But that's ge- the general consensus yeah, from what sure. we've gathered and what we know about steroids. But um, this has shaped the diet advice in terms of expectations for weight loss that in 12 weeks regardless of how much weight you need to lose it can be achieved in 12 weeks that seems to be the magic number right well that's not necessarily true so let's take the demographic that's listening to us over 40 right probably works full-time does this recreationally has a job has a job has kids has friends right has relatives that fly in from out of town has business trips social life sure get sick is not on drugs yeah is not that strong right you know Right. right this person it might lose weight the first week, yep. the second week. Then mom comes in from out of town. Wife cooks her pecan yep. pie. Sure. Okay. Sure. So they did a solid six days. They had a nice meal with the family the seventh day. They didn't lose that week. Yeah. Then the next week, brother comes in from overseas. Yeah. Same thing. Then the next week, there's a bachelor party in town. So there's three weeks where no weight was lost. But then they got a month where nothing happens. Sure. You know, pretty lame boring existence for lack of a better word right yeah sure and they lose weight for four weeks mm-hmm. and then they get sick and they gain two pounds back right yeah it sounds very similar to the lp yeah, right yeah, yeah sure so it's sure. the same kind of thing it's like a zigzag thing you know yeah it's a deload it's life deloading them yeah. life deloading them over time there's there's yeah. situations and circumstances where they're being deloaded just because of their social structure their job their family stressors, whatever it is. Exactly. You know? And so they don't, they don't, they don't lose yeah. weight in a linear. F- I mean, it's still linear. Mm-hmm. There's still, there's still a downward curve, but it's, just it's not weekly. Not, it's not a smooth. That's right. No. And do you find that some of your clients at some point mm-hmm. lose weight? Let's say you have someone that's morbidly obese or hundred pounds overweight, right? They're going to lose weight rapidly at first. Mm-hmm. And then they're going to kind of hit a wall, right? What do you do when they hit that wall? So that often happens as a function of, you know, metabolic adaptation. Right. Or metabolic damage. We've heard yeah. that word, right? Or the coach has the person dieting too long. I don't do that, you know? Sure. But um, let's say that happens. You got two options. One, you keep pushing. I typically advise against that. Um, but typically we'll take a break. Okay, we're going to up your calories. How do I do that? Well, the first thing I do is up carbs because yep. we didn't even get into that. So training-wise, we've already established why protein is important. That doesn't change whether you're gaining or losing weight. Sure. In fact, it might go up higher when you're losing weight. Yeah, you and, bet. Yeah. You bet. Drive lean mass. Yeah, because yeah. your goal there is to preserve lean mass or maybe gain it if it's still possible for you. Sure. Um, so then the second thing is your strength training. You're not going to be able to utilize fat in a lifting workout. Right, right. And uh, – you know, the way we train three to five reps, you know, you're using mostly phosphocreatine, ATP, yeah. another podcast on that. You need carbs. But each set, you're b- breaking down a little bit more glycogen, a little That's bit right. more glycogen. Carbs, so, carbs, carbs. Yeah. So the goal for the strength trainee is to lose fat on as much carbs and protein as possible. Right. But let's say you hit a wall, right? So at this point, training is probably going to crap. You know, you're not hitting, yep. you're, you're missing reps, you sure. feel low energy. For, you're probably partially depleted of glycogen, yep. which is preventing okay. you from being able to perform optimally. So the first thing I do is I try to ramp those carbs up. I'm like, all okay. right, let's get this person to baseline carbs. Let's keep the fat low for now. You know, yep. let's get their energy back first. So it's almost like they're still kind of on a diet the first couple of weeks, but not really because they feel better. Yeah, they just can't go out and eat pizza. You know? Yeah, sure, sure. So once they say, oh, okay, lifts are coming back up. I feel alive again. You know. Then I start, okay, let's add a few grams of fat here. You know, so there I'm conservative because I don't want to get rebound weight gain either. Sure, sure. So on the way, so when you get the person who hits the wall, the first thing you do is get their carbs back up so they can train and then uh, play around with the fat for a few months. Hold so, them steady. Yeah, so if I think about it this way, yeah. let's say someone has had this great weight loss for 
let's say they, they need they needed to lose a hundred pounds and we've lost 30, 40 pounds mm -hmm. and they hit a wall. Is it accurate to think about it in this way that they've gotten to their a metabolic rate level where their diet is matching their metabolic rate now potentially? Yes. And so there's a there's a there there's a net neutral balance now. Mm -hmm. So we, we have to do one of two things. We either have to raise their activity level mm -hmm. to and keep their diet the same, or we have to, if, if their activity level is appropriate, their strength training, their lifting, whatever else, conditioning, then we have to drop their calories down a little lower. Is that possible? Yeah, I didn't even... Because they're a yeah. smaller individual. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't even get to that. Yeah. Yeah. So you have those, let's say you're going to persist. Yeah, yeah. And try to continue losing fat, right? Right, right. Those are your two options. You can increase the activity, which in that case... They're lifting four days a week. They have a kid. They have a wife. They have a job. You're probably not going to do that. No, you're not going to add six hours of cardio right, per right. week, you know, because right. let's talk about that now. So lifting weights itself doesn't burn a humongous amount of calories. Right. Nobody's right. So claiming that's, that. That's not your big return on investment. No. Um, you gain muscle mass, so then you carry fat better, right? Right. And so, you have a higher metabolic rate when you yeah. have more muscle mass. Is that right? Yeah, that's precisely right. Okay. I mean, it's not... You're not going to go from 2,000 calories to 4,000 calories. Right, you know, it's, right. it's a small amount. You know, you might be able to have an extra snack per day. You know, sure. Maybe sure. an extra meal if you've been training long enough. But um, think about it like this. So, like, this is what people don't get, you know, especially your quote-unquote skinny fat population. They think they need to lose fat. And then I'm like, well, if you lose fat, you're going to be 120 pounds as a 5'10 male. Well, nobody sure. wants that, you know, if you lose sure. enough fat to show abs. Sure. So think about it like this. You have a pillow, right? doesn't really have a whole lot of, you know, shape to it. Right, It's just right. a soft, squishy pillow, right? Versus something that's, you know, much more dense. So let's say that, uh, actually, candy bar is a good example. You can yeah. see the shape of the can candy bar, right? Yeah, sure. The wrapper, sure. right? So it's funny, I'm using a candy bar for yeah. an abs analogy, but it's <laughs> the first thing that popped in my mind. But we'll stick to that because it kind of yeah. looks like abs, right? Yeah, okay. So look at a candy bar versus, like, what's the gripper thing called? Yeah, like a little hand a stress, gripper. Yeah, 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 stress ball or whatever. Yeah, stress ball, yeah. soft and squishy yeah, yeah. versus, uh, you know. Similar volumes, yeah, basically. Si similar volumes, right. but the squishy thing doesn't really have much shape to it, not much right. density. That's right. the word I'm trying to use, right? right? Sure. That's what I'm alluding to here. Versus the candy bar, you can see the exact shape, sometimes even the logo right. through the wrapper, right? Right, right. So let's say that um, you started putting something like pennies into the stress ball or into right. the pillow let's say it becomes you, more dense yeah it becomes now you start seeing these little shapes of pennies yeah on the sure. outline of it right sure so it's the same thing right if you take somebody with 30 pounds of fat on their body right and then you let's let's say that their baseline muscle mass is 150 pounds let's say okay. they have 30 pounds of fat 150 pounds of muscle all right now you've upped that lean body mass that muscle mass up to 160 pounds of muscle and sure the, let's say the fat stayed at 30 it doesn't work exactly this way but just right. for a visual right right that's like saying okay we've taken that stress ball and put you know a roll of quarters in there right okay. now sure, it doesn't yeah. now it doesn't look like a big squishy stress ball anymore right. even though the amount of gel or whatever is in there is the right. same so it looks like the same volume it's just more dense yeah so what i'm yeah. saying is let's say you're 18 percent body fat like okay. myself, I'm probably 18% body fat right. now at 183 okay. pounds. When uh, I was 183 pounds at 25% body fat, the problem wasn't that I was too fat. I was under-muscled. Right. So sure. let's erase this skinny fat term from our vocabulary yeah. and look at it as under-muscled. The reason yeah. that you're squishy at a low body weight, at a normal BMI, body mass index, body mass index is weight over height squared. Yeah. Right? Kilogram meter squared. Okay. Um. Let's say you're at a normal BMI, which is 20 to 25. Okay. Right? But your body fat percentage is 25%. Why are you so squishy? Oh, I need to lose fat. No, no, you don't need to lose fat. You're under muscled. Yeah, since yeah. since your since your body fat percentage is a percentage, mm -hmm. it's a percentage of your total body mass. Yep. And so if I want to decrease, I can view it this way. Instead of losing body fat, mm -hmm. what you're really saying, correct me if I'm wrong here, yeah. is that I can increase my lean mass yeah. and my body fat can stay the same 
in the actual weight, but the percentage decreases. Mm -hmm. So let's say if I weighed 180 mm -hmm. and I was at 25% body fat and now I go to 190 and now I'm at 15% body yeah. fat, I lost 10% body fat because I gained 10 pounds of muscle mass. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm yeah. just using ratios yeah, yeah. as, as so an example. Definitely want to communicate that. That's true. Yeah. 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 So, if, so if you increase your lean body mass, it decreases your percent body fat. Right. But, exactly. But let's say you take two people at the same percent body fat. Right? Okay. Yeah. One's They're both 20% body fat, let's but, say. But one's 160 and one's 180. Right. Who looks like they trained? Uh, the one who is 180 yeah. looks like they train exactly because they're 20% body fat of 180. Of, yeah. So they have more lean mass to start with. So yeah. And the one who's 20% of 160 has less lean mass and more body fat. Exactly. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. I'm getting better at explaining this every time. Yeah. It's hard yeah. because yeah. people think about th people think about total body weight, right. but they don't think about body composition. Right. What actually is making up that body? Yeah. So let's, we talked about this. So you have the individual, they've lost weight, they've lost weight, now they've plateaued. Mm -hmm. So what you're going to do is you're going to keep their protein high. Mm -hmm. You're going to drive their carbs up maybe a little bit mm -hmm. to increase their, their energy level, mm -hmm. to give them more energy, make them feel more active, mm -hmm. but you're going to keep their fat fairly low because right. it's so high in cal caloric value. Yep. And then at some point, you may drop them back down again into a caloric um, deficit, mm -hmm. not surplus, right. so that you can get that below their metabolic rate, yep. their burn rate. Yep. But you got to keep that protein fairly high, right? Yep. Because you're driving lean mass, muscle mass, which my understanding is muscle mass burns more calories per unit of volume this than fat mass does. This correct? is true. Yeah. Um, the caveat there is that. You're not going to double your metabolic rate by adding muscle, but you're going to burn more calories, you know? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So yeah. some yeah. people think, oh, I'm going to gain muscle and burn like thousands of extra calories. It's not yeah. quite that, no. either, you know, but yeah, no. you increase lean body mass, you burn more calories. Sure. For sure. Sure. Um, for this person, they're going to take a break and then in the gym, they're going to drive PRs. The, yeah. And the, ma sure. the maintenance phase is a good window to drive PRs. So since we're talking about over 40... I've been training a male who's very strong yep. over 40, Carl. Yep. Yep, you know, sure. Carl shoot. Yeah, you for, bet. For three years now. Uh, the first time I cut him, we went from 265. So he was a overweight power lifter. Sure. Essentially. I mean, yeah. He was, yeah, he was competing at the time. He was an overweight power lifter. And uh, we took him down. He had started to have, uh, he initially hired me to fix his deadlift, mm -hmm. which we did because he was benching more than he could deadlift wow. which was a problem i know he benches way over 400 the guy's crazy uh, yeah. strong when i got a hold of him he was pulling sumo at meets uh, sumo deadlift was 562 yeah. and then he was wow. not training conventional but he was yeah. squatting 585 and he was he, he was benching 455 yeah, pounds crazy. at age 45 the guy's crazy at the strong. he's 47 now but at the time he was 45 yeah. Yeah. benching 455 but then he couldn't deadlift at conventional yeah sure so i'm like we got to fix this you're starting strength coach we got to fix this yeah you know? sure. so that was my coaching challenge and then in talking to him he's like i'm worried about my glucose because diabetes runs in my family and it's creeping up you know it's not diabetic but i don't want it to get there so i'm like well you're 265 and you're i don't know what his percent was but it was he's probably, not very tall no, he's, he's five, what, 5'10"? He's 5'11". 5'11"? Yeah. Okay. Probably yeah. be six foot if he didn't have this kyphosis. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but yeah. Um, we uh, took him down to 230. And yeah. Actually, 235. So he went from 265 to 235. He started struggling in the gym. As soon as he was missing reps, I put his calories back up. And then he kept losing weight, which was odd. I don't yeah. understand that phenomenon. I've seen this with other clients, too. Sure. It actually happened with the guy that we're sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Olick? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He yeah, dropped sure. down to one... 90 but i was yeah. feeding him more and he kept losing so yeah. th we don't understand why this happens but this is something a lot of diet coaches have, have reported when they start refeeding i guess because you're technically probably still in a deficit if you're going up slow maybe yeah. that's part of it you know yeah and i think the yeah. other thing with like oleg was was that we had driven his muscle mass mm -hmm. significantly so even though he only weighed 190 yeah we took him down from 230 Two, 240 think, 242, 240 yeah okay to 190, he had a ton of muscle mass. Yeah. And so when you think about it, he was a calorie burning freaking machine. Yeah. And so we we weren't feeding him enough calories. No. And you had to continue to ramp He's him up. He's eating 500 carbs now. Yeah. 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 
It's crazy. It's crazy. And, and he's staying at 190 something. Yeah. So it's just, yeah. And his fat's not low. It's like an 80 or 90. Yeah. yeah. I know. Yeah. So he's know. It blows your mind. Yeah. So Carl, yeah, we took him down to 235. I tried to refeed him. And then he settled at 230. And then. Because, you know, he didn't care about aesthetics. Yeah, and, sure. Until he got the result later. But sure. at the time, he didn't care. So I'm like, okay, we got to get this strength up. So we started pushing his weight on the bar and really focusing on his training for six months. So he did a six-month maintenance phase. And then he's like, all right, let's finish this thing. So then yeah. we went from 230 down to 215. And then he got, I think, 213. That was probably water. Yeah, but 213 sure. was the lowest that ticked on the scale. And he started showing abs. He was about 13% body fat at 213. That's a big dude. Yeah, <laughs> sure, know? sure. And uh, his bench went up. <laughs> yeah. His bench went up to 460 that year. Yeah. And he's currently benching 470 at 40, wow. 47. So, like, Rip, I was talking to Rip about this the other day. And I'm like, you know, this because he's like, you don't hit PRs at my age, you know, when you're yeah. over 40. Then I'm sure. like, what about Carl? I'm like, the guy's yeah. still hitting PRs at 47. And yeah, he's like, sure. That man has toxic levels of testosterone, yeah. and he's drug free. So that you know, yeah, when he's mentioning yeah. that, he's like, he's sure. toxic levels of testosterone. Yeah, and uh, you know, I told Carl that he said that he's like, that's probably true. You know, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I I find that that um, that the more we strength train the older yeah. individual, mm-hmm. and then we control their caloric intake to be either like we talked about yeah. earlier in the podcast to be either be either be a caloric surplus to, mm-hmm. to help them yeah. gain weight a caloric mm-hmm. net neutral value mm-hmm. to help them maintain weight or a caloric deficit to help them lose weight we're going to drive the protein the protein's always going to be up. relatively yeah, high for all of them and we we talked about that because they got to have protein to build muscle mass yeah. but i find that um, that individuals even as they age can get crazy numbers, especially if they've never really strength trained very much in their lifetime. You right. Know? Yeah. So I'm in my fifties and you know, I'm, I'm hitting PRs right now and yeah. barbell lifts, but yeah. I didn't do heavy barbell, li- barbell lifting until my forties. Right. Yeah. So, you know, historically, I mean, I guess you could say I've been weight lifting quote unquote for 10 years, right. but I'm still hitting PRs 10 yeah. years later. And so, and still fairly lean. So I think the key there is, is that as individuals do this, that they've got to recognize that a lot of factors play into this genetics, Mm -hmm. history, how long have you been training? But the number one goal is that we want to use science when, when available, right? The best science that we have with the body of knowledge that we have today to be able to drive either weight gain, weight neutral or weight loss with our trainees. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That's correct. So, so I love what you're doing with starting strength, with producing papers that will cover some of these areas. I love what you're doing with SSOC, with starting strength online coaching. And I see this with my clients that you're working with and that your team, Audrey's working with several Mm -hmm. of my clients um, that you oversee. I know you're, you're the head nutrition coach there, but I love seeing the fact that when we apply not fad diets, Mm -hmm. fad nutrition, all these different you know, mm-hmm. concepts and, but when we look at just basic science and then we apply really good coaching mm-hmm. along the way on the, on the fitness side, right. whether it be cardiovascular endurance training or strength training, right. that we can get incredible results with these individuals. Yep. Um, and a lot of times what I think it needs, what individuals need is plain and simple. I think if you're, if you're struggling with either gaining weight or losing weight and you haven't been able to do it on your own hire a coach yeah hire an expert for a while yeah and get educated learn increase your individual skill set but rely on someone else that's an expert for a while and gain a tremendous amount of momentum towards reaching your goals sooner right right yeah and i can't tell you how many guys have come to me as as strength clients and said man i wish i would have hired a coach six months or a year yeah. earlier i could have saved a ton of time right. and you probably see the same thing in nutrition yeah so yeah no 100 percent. because you're your worst own worst enemy oh yeah I, I ha- i've had a coach for years after the lp i yeah. always had a coach because I hurt myself when I do it on my own. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I, yeah. and I tell you, no matter how smart you are, yeah. you're usually your worst coach. <laughs> yeah. You know, you need that accountability to someone outside. Yeah. You want to push yeah. it when you shouldn't and you want to sandbag it when you shouldn't. Yeah. You know? Exactly. So. Exactly. It's good to yeah. have that outside mindset. Yeah. And, um, 
Well, man, Robert, thanks for being with me today. I think we're going to close this down. Cool. But um, if, if people would like to get a hold of you and find out more about your nutrition and ca- counseling, mm-hmm. whether it be training for strength training and uh, fitness training, or whether it just be nutrition um, coaching alone, how can they get a hold of you? So if you are interested in diet coaching, um, my website is www.weightsandplates.com. Um, if you're interested in coaching from SSOC, you can find me at rsantana at ssonlinecoaching.com. Oh, Good. And uh, all the rates are listed at uh, Starting Strength Online Coaching's website. Hey, y'all. Coach Trent here. Just wanted to let you know that our friends at SSOC are running a pretty sweet deal right now. So if you go to startingstrengthonlinecoaching.com, you can get your first month of online coaching with them for 49 bucks, And you can get your first month of online coaching plus nutrition coaching. Um, so that's uh, barbell coaching in addition to diet and uh, nutrition coaching for just 79 bucks for that first month. So normally SSOC costs about $300 for that first month um, and nutrition coaching would cost $300 plus another 70 or $80 on top of that. So this is a pretty steep discount that they're offering right now. So if you're interested in working with Santana or a member of his team to get your diet in check, to have somebody there to watch your technique and form, and just be available to answer any questions that you have about training as you go along, then Starting Strength Online Coaching is an excellent option. So go see our friends over there at startingstrengthonlinecoaching.com and uh, take advantage of that sweet discount. And, and they, yeah. they might get you, but they might get also one of your staff, right? So, yeah. So I um, don't take very many clients anymore because, right. um, sure. you know, I'm running the thing and I have like a handful know, of clients. Yeah, <laughs> I, have, I have quite a bit of clients. Yeah, and sure. I have like, I think I have 10 coaches under me at this yeah. point or something close to that number. Yeah. So it's awesome. Yeah. I typically am not available, but sometimes I am. So you should, you know, if you want to work with me specifically, you can request it and uh, sure. do it on a case by case basis. But yeah, the staffers at um, SSSC yeah, will great, take care yeah. of that. Right. Yeah. We have three, including myself, we have three RDs right now. Yeah. It's cool. Um, and uh, several um, strength coaches that have coached diet before, you yeah, know, and cool. are very, that are trained by me and follow the system that I wrote. So, yeah. And I know you just recently came out with a new, new um, uh, model that y'all are, y'all are going to be using for 2019. That's awesome, man. I've read through yeah. some of it and it's great. And um, it's going to be a great foundation and platform for you to work with our client base. Yeah. So that's cool. I think that's very important too. We kind of touched on that just the real quick. Um, we're kind of shifting away not shifting away, all of our tools are always available. So we sure. always have meal plans, we always have macros, but we're going to try is our default is going to be um, taking a behavioral approach. And yeah, it's instead cool. of prescribing a diet, we've deconstructed the diet into individual habits. Yeah, that's great. And those habits will be assigned each week to the client and they have to achieve that habit for seven days because we want consistency. It takes seven days to you know see any type of fat loss if yeah. you're a weight loss client. Or to see any weight gain if you're a weight gain client. It usually sure. happens over the course of a week. So we want to really hammer this consistency piece home because that's yeah. the number one area where clients fail. And that could be a whole other podcast. Yeah, own, no, you know? that's great. No, yeah. I, I've always said that, that weight loss, weight gain, or weight neutral is all based on human behavior. Yep. And when people are ready to change, they change. It's true. And so, um, but they've got to have the right guidance and right information and, and be basing it on science. And I think that's what you guys do. So, hey guys, thanks for, for joining us on the 40 Fit Radio podcast. And thanks for joining the 40 Fit Nation. You can reach us at 40 Fit Radio on Instagram and also at 40 Fit Masters Community Group on Facebook. You can also go to 40fit.com and click on the 40 Fit Radio tab and you can download the podcast there. And if you want to reach me on Instagram, it's at DL Deaton on Instagram. Thanks for joining us. And do you have an Instagram too? I do. The, the underscore Robert underscore Santana. There we go. Thanks for joining us today on Nutrition. And thanks for joining the 40 Fit Nation.